Healthy place making. I think there's so much being spoken about why healthy public spaces are needed for inclusiveness, for getting people together, for making a community more healthy. I'm coming from a country which has 18% of the world's population, but land parcels which are probably one-fifth of the United States. So public spaces are at a premium. Yet, if I'm going to see what's happening in my city, the rich are sending their children lesser and lesser to public spaces, right? Is that good? Is that bad? Why is that happening? How do we make it more inclusive? And how do we innovate on public spaces? Talking to me are three really extraordinary people. Let me invite my panelists on stage. Fleur Pellerin, former culture minister, France founder and chairwoman of Coralea Capital. Fleur, thank you so much for joining us here. Hi. Exemplary portfolios, three portfolios with the French government, please. We also have with us Vicky Chan, founder of Void Obvious Architects. He's, of course, passionate about very innovative designs and children learning about sustainable design as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. My third guest is Vera Baboon, former mayor of Bethlehem. Of course, you heard her yesterday morning in the opening panel, and I did too. Vera, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to have you with us. All right. So I think I'm going to start on a very personal note. And uh, like I said, the first question is, how do we make our, city, make our public spaces more inclusive? Today, you have a situation where the rich say, hey, if there are a lot of underprivileged families coming into a public space, then you actually have a problem of safety and security. Would you like to take that? Yeah, I think there's no easy answer to that question. Um, we have the situation in France where uh, uh, this segregation, this geography of uh, inclusion and exclusion is uh, determined by um, the presence of schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have um, people who will, cha who will change their, uh, the, the place where they live uh, according to the quality of the school which is in the area, because they want to, to, to send their children to uh, good schools. And so now in France, we have uh, this issue. We have this issue in Paris. We have this situ situation in, in big cities, where you have a new geography of cities around schools, where all the uh, rich people or privileged people will go near the schools uh, that have uh, a good, a good quality, a, a good standard, exactly. And it creates a new ge geography in, uh, in, in the city. And for instance, I live uh, in the suburbs of Paris, in an area which is uh, in, in the process of gentrification now. Mm -hmm. But it's still very difficult because the schools are not as good as the school in Paris. So people hesitate a lot to come to these places because they uh, fear that their children will have less chances than other children. And so I think one of the bigger uh, uh, challenges to re-establish some kind of social mixity is to work on this education issue, for instance. So to guarantee the fact that uh, these schools will have uh, uh, resources, will have uh, good teachers. So that's a policy which is not very easy to implement, but it's something the French government, for instance, has been working on uh, by defining special territories where they put uh, where the government will put more resources and more money to increase the uh, quality of the, of the service in the school. Um, there can also be some um, thinking about uh, architectural, the design of space, the yes. planning, uh, urban planning. And for instance, I have this example also of a, a new um, project in Paris it, uh, uh, near, the, near the Seine River, which is a, very, a brand new uh, district where they built this brand new buildings and one part of the building is for, uh, um, is for sale. So you, you can buy it and it's quite expensive because it's quite lu luxurious. It's a high standard of uh, uh, housing. And the other part, but in the same building, uh, will be uh, very um, low, moderate uh, rental okay. houses. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't have m a, a lot of financial resources. So they managed to create uh, um, a building with two different purposes, but it looks exactly the same from outside. So you, you don't have the feeling that one part is for the rich people and another part, uh, a less beautiful part, is for <coughs> people. So I think this kind of initiatives 
can help redesign the space and, mm -hmm. and contribute to mix the populations. Wiki, would yeah. you agree that, uh, you know, we really have to think through, so not all cities can actually have a 101-acre central park, right? And more and more communities are getting congregated as per the socioeconomic strata. And what public spaces are meant to do become cultural, you know, uh, melting pots, bring everybody together is really not happening. They, they, there's more and more socioeconomic divide in many of the public spaces. Is that something which has crossed your mind as a designer? I, I agree with you. Uh, but I also think it has to do with the program. Like if we look at like um, the High Line in New York, uh, they turned, you know, a abandoned uh, railroad into a really successful, uh, successful park, and the park really turned the neighborhood into a really upscale area where, like, you feel like uh, only rich people can go, which in some way defeated the purpose of building the High Line uh, uh, originally. Right. But if we, uh, I, uh, when I was employed at a different corporate office, uh, I worked on the Yankee Stadium. Uh, they took down the old Yankee Stadium and turned that old site into a new park. And in that new park, uh, we had like different ballpark, different sport. Traditionally, in France, where the Yankee Stadium uh, uh, is, uh, it's actually a pretty low-income area. But having this new park where uh, children can actually come and enjoy different sport, in, in some way, that program really like take down the barrier. The, uh, I mean, yes, sport. It is such an equalizer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in terms of like making it more inclusive, like I mean, throughout the design, uh, there are more like uh, ADA ramps, uh, so that you know, even you know, people with uh, on wheelchair or different uh, 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 special need will be able to enjoy different like part of the design. So there are many tools that we can actually make the part uh, uh, more accessible. But at the same time, I think the program has to uh, do a lot with that uh, as well. I, at the same, like while we're thinking about the program, I don't think we want it to be too uh, restrictive in terms of like, our imagination. While we are making that Yankee Stadium Park, uh, we wanted to make a giant like mountain where kids can go there during the winter time and do their uh, you know, slash. Yeah, many people during the community meeting complain if I, my, my my children is on wheelchair, I won't be able to go up to the mountain. But we insisted that like like that would become a very signature place to, to go. So, so we end up uh, making it uh, at, at uh, various height. So in, in, in some way, like, uh, like uh, I, I think we have to make it inclusive, but at the same right. time, be creative about how we make it inclusive as well. Would you agree with that, Vera, that a lot more thought needs to go into creating inclusive public spaces, whether you want to break the socioeconomic barriers or actually make it accessible to all different age groups of people, senior citizens, and also make provision for people who are differently abled? Um, I believe that parks are parks. Okay. And they are open spaces for everyone to attend. To make them inclusive, that is very important because they are a completely different ambiance that whether it is at home or the surrounding areas. Parks, open space. Parks, liberty to enter. Parks, a place where you can move, play with freedom and liberty and mainly to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. What happens in the park is very important. Either parents go with children or children might go there practicing cultural interaction, practicing each playing as he, she wants, right? However, if you want to speak about the social dichotomy mm -hmm. between the rich and the poor, originally parks were not created in order to enhance or increase that dichotomy. And that is why I believe, and I will raise another question. Rich people might not bring their children to a park where they might find, you know... Um, not so rich. Not. May I ask a question? Yes. Will the poor be permitted to go inside other parks in rich venues, mainly for people who are, you know, uh, rich to take their children there. This is not our idea about car parks. Car parks is simply, purely a place, an open space where who wants to be, let him be. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go, let him her go. 
parks, no one can value parks except if they cannot do parks in their own cities yeah. because they simply do not have space. Imagine that you are in a place where parks are there, very inclusive, uh, prepared. It comes as well to the culture of our families, yeah. how family bring about their children to be themselves inclusive, mm -hmm. to accept others. Yeah. And that is a very important dimension. Mm. We don't need that dichotomy, but it is there if they choose to be there. For me, parks, number one, is to be used freely, openly, for whoever wants to go there. So they are by nature inclusive. It's uh, the family values you believe will drive that inclusiveness or not. But, yes. but you, let's then raise another important question. Uh, we all try to bring our children with the right values. In a growing digital world, we are actually grappling with a new problem. So we have these wonderful parks that town planners are creating. They're finding spaces. I mean, I looked at some figures and I was pleasantly surprised to find that public spaces have actually grown. This is one go across the globe. If you look at an aggregate number of public spaces, they've actually grown. So this is something that town planners are very conscious about. Inclusivity is also being designed. My question now to you, Fleur, is what do we do with our children who go to parks and are tweeting? <laughs> Um, How I do we actually get them out of the digital world and use these wonderful public spaces which town planners are creating? Uh, is, there, is there a way to do that? Yeah, well, first, there's a, an individual question because uh, a lot is a matter of education. So uh, there's something that maybe the state, the government, the institu institutions cannot regulate is the way you uh, bring up your children. So uh, probably a, a decent consumption of uh, social networks and, and Twitter and uh, all the likes is, is also a matter of education. Uh, <clears throat> and then I think that uh, paradoxically at the age of uh, digital um, meetups, uh, physical encounter uh, has become more important. So Absolutely. I'm not maybe not uh, talking about teenagers who spend the whole days in uh, playing video games in the home by themselves, but uh, still, I think that these social networks and the way teenagers use them uh, is the new way to communicate. So it used to be the phone calls for us, or the Facebook Messenger, or the emails, and now it's just uh, Snapchat or uh, Instagram. So it's a new way uh, for them to communicate. But then they still, I mean at least in European countries or in, in, in cities where the distances are, are, are human. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they still have to go to, to school, they still have to go um, maybe shopping, they still have to, you know, so I think they have a geography in their lives and they, still, they will still use the public space to experiment, so being outside, meeting with other people. Uh, so I think the, the way um, cities think about uh, uh, walking mm -hmm. is very important. Cycling, you see a lot of cities now. Uh, you have, uh, of course, uh, cities like Copenhagen, or um, which were really uh, in advance uh, in terms of making it easy for cyclists, uh, bi bicycle to, to ride. But in Paris, we see a lot of uh, new uh, cycling uh, areas develop, and it's the same in, in many different cities. Uh, so I think that's a, a way to facilitate also uh, how you move, because I think in a city what is important is the geographic display of activities, mm -hmm. where people live, where they work, and how they get from one point to another, and when, when, where entertainment is located. So it's important to know how people can go from one place to another and experiment the different functions of the, of the city. Uh, so I, I'm not quite worried about, uh, about our children okay. uh, and the way they can still use public space, because I see a, a growing attention of city planners, of mayors, to you know uh, that kind of uh, to mobility mm -hmm. issues. So I think it you know it will still be a very important part in the way we inhabit the city and the way we uh, in inhabit public space. I, I'm quite heartened to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> you're dealing I'm with you. <laughs> 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 you're, you're dealing with maybe I'm dealing with a teenager who's difficult <laughs> to <laughs> phone off, and, and I have different problems. Uh, you're dealing with children. I mean, you're actually doing classes with children, mm -hmm. and you've. I mean, last I saw the number was 3,000. You teach them about sustainability yeah. and sustainable design. Uh, my question to you is, uh, would, would that generation of uh, youngsters who are losing to digital or have mm -hmm. the danger of losing to digital, 
how can you enthuse them more to use public spaces? That's a, actually a great question. Uh, Is it the design, like you said, sports have, have activities yeah. for them? So, so they're just so compelled to come and use it. I think the question is actually twofold. The first part of it has to deal with like design. Like, um, we have to make like our public spaces more interactive, more interesting. I, I feel like many people are so afraid of lawsuit, are so afraid of being having their children getting hurt in the park that we make the tr uh, playground so safe that it is becoming so boring. <laughs> if we are looking at like children, they they love to like do things that they're not supposed to be doing. Exciting stuff. Yeah, like we have to include part of that. Uh, I teach like children, one of the classes that I teach them is how to design a playground. And we ask them to use the spaghetti, broccoli, tomato to make up their own playground. And we ask them, hey, what if like the playground is all made out of food, like just like chocolate uh, factory. And then, you know, people love that idea. If the real playground can have that interactive quality where people can actually be part of the creation of the park, I don't think people will be focusing on the cell phone as much as like the actual uh, play itself. And the second part is uh, I think it has to deal with like uh, parents, like uh, not only they have to worry less about their kid getting like you know hurt in the playground or public spaces. Uh, the second part is like if they can spend a bit more time with their children and less on their own cell phone, then <laughs> uh, I feel like uh, that may be actually solving the well problem. Well said. Well said. All right. So it's pretty much a family culture. We're coming back to that. But do you buy that point, uh, Vera, that you know you have to make public spaces more and more interesting? to captivate the young. I, I know you started with saying parks are parks. They're open to everybody. And the idea is that everyone should come in. They're green lungs for a city. People should be able to breathe, interact, talk. But more and more with, with a fight with digital, which is so exciting, uh, do you also need to now look at parks as more than green lungs? Design them more interactive? Uh, definitely. Now, we are in the century where most of our citizens are the digital citizens, mm -hmm. where all of them, they master the using electronics, the Instagrams, whatever, social media, at home, outside home. And when I said that parks are parks, it means to be open space. But, and this is a big but, usually in new needs create a new innovative ideas in order to suffer our to suffice our new needs mm -hmm. and i have seen almost three young men and they are young people uh, standing here giving their innovative ideas as solutions for whatever our smart cities need now this is a new mode of parks where children are integrated into another medium which is the digital let us think about families as well. In our smart city era, also parents are spending a lot of time in their work. Right. Okay? And so children might go with or without families. So let the solution come from the youngsters. Mm -hmm. Let the solution come be thought of by our young students, even in schools. The way we want our parks to look like, even if... Um, all the digital that we refer to, even if the social uh, you know, barrier is there. But uh, definitely we want to give alternatives in the c parks, mm -hmm. not only the open space, but give our youngsters, our special needs, our families, some kind of an alternative to spend their time there, activities, innovative ideas that our young people might come up with, maybe 30 years from now or even less, 20 years from now, the parks will look differently. The kind of innov innovative services will be given will exclusively depend on our needs for parks. Absolutely. No, I, I really like that idea. Does any government actually take children into account when master planning parks and public spaces? Vicky, you want to take that it, question? Do you, uh, have, you, have you ever had, let's say, a focus group discussion? A lot of management companies, before they launch anything, would want to know what people need, right? Have we done, have, have architects and master planners really spoken to families and done a focus group to see 
what kind of open public spaces should we be designing? Or are we still living in the glory of, oh my God, there's a New York Central Park, which is so stunning, so let's create a Songdo Central Park. There, is, there are town squares which are fabulous, they're old, they're, they carry the heritage of a city, so let's try and recreate another town square. Is a thought going with involving younger family needs? Yeah, the, uh, the short answer to your question is like, it's very difficult because like, professional, like let's say in the adult world, doesn't take kid advice or children advice very seriously. In some way, I, I actually, you know, I, I, I learn from children more than I learn from other adults. But uh, that's just me and many other like, architects or urban planners doesn't actually have the same taste. So it, it's very difficult, uh, it, it's a, a very difficult battle to actually push that idea forward. We did submit proposal similar uh, to what you just said, having you know, a workshop with children to have them design part of the space. But it, it, it just didn't work out like the way we planted it. But, the, uh, but to counter like, uh, kind of what you just said, like, hey, we, we, we can still kind of move forward in a different way. So uh, what I did was like, I continued to teach ideas to these children when they grow up. Uh, when now most of the, my target are 10 years old. So 10 years from now, they will grow up and maybe become like city official. So by then, uh, I hope to actually change what I wasn't able to achieve. Like, so by teaching them like, the idea I'm not able yeah. to do, I think uh, hopefully they will do it. <laughs> no, that's amazing what you're doing with children to you know, get them involved in design and understand sustainable design from a very early stage. Uh, but Flo, coming to you, I mean, I'm curious, why are families and children never spoken to when, uh, when public spaces are designed? Am I opening a can of worms? Actually, you did, Vera, I didn't. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> no, because an FMCD company, before they launch a product, do do a dipstick, and they will actually do a dipstick with their end consumer. Yeah, and, but and, and we never do it, right? I'm not sure. So I'm not sure we never do it. Uh, you know, sometimes before a project is carried on or implemented, there's a sort of what we call a public inquiry. Okay, uh, there is. Maybe, and sometimes I think local governments uh, uh, consult and ask the uh, you know the opinion of uh, people who live nearby, of inhabitants, and among the inhabitants, you have families and maybe. Um, uh, you know, young par parents of young children, and uh, I'm sure they. Uh, so you it's know, already they, happening yeah, in I, some I, places. I, I think it so. Is happening. I think so. I think so. But then, you know, the user of public space, the main user, is probably adults. I mean, you're not supposed to let all the the children, young, very young children, by themselves uh, take in the public decision. spaces <laughs> or, or take the decisions. But I think the uh, opinion of families with young children, so they know what kind of space. They would need to uh, entertain the children, to uh, have them uh, take advantage of uh, fresh air, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm sure they, I'm sure they do. All yeah. right, it's not happening much in my country, unfortunately. Oh. But mm -hmm. yes, Vera, go ahead. Just I want to make or to stress on a very important point. I'm not saying that when we design. Uh, a park to ask children directly. No, not really. I'm saying a little bit of involvement of very families important. Is and important. what I mean. When usually we build a master plan, usually there are architects, other experts come to participate as municipalities. But within our meeting with the community as well, we meet families. Mm. There are mothers, parents that come, and many do reflect the point of view of their children, even in the mm. most uh, minute points that you don't imagine that children might tackle. A simple statement might change the whole design stemming from the need or the experience of that even 10 years old. Right. Another very important thing that I really uh, would like to see um, um, for my children or grandchildren nowadays, again, the three young men who were here on the stage, they created and had innovative uh, starts up and, and uh, that stems from the need from their own lenses as young people, as uh, global citizens. But they trying to tell us in a way or another, there are solutions. The same with parks. The young man is still not so far from being a child. Let them go. Let them look at parks 10 years from now, how do they look like? Taking care of 
considering your question on how to be more inclusive, uh, different than the open air, and you will see that you will have, honestly, a lot of ideas that we never expected. But it is maybe an idea to be tackled. Mm. Parks 10 years from now, how can we, what do you think we can do? Absolutely, yes. I actually want to add to that. Um, I agree with uh, what everyone said. Uh, so I, I just told you that uh, I have other adults who don't believe in children's design or having children to lead the design. So what I actually did uh, for this most of this year is to take children to enter adult competition. So we actually won an award in Italy. And so it was kind of like in their face, right? Like we were telling them, oh, children's work is actually better than adult. Not only that, like uh, part of our work is now actually uh, in, in display in DC uh, next to the White House. So in some way, like we're like, wow, like bam, another way to tell uh, different like uh, disbeliever, like our, our, what children can do and achieve uh, at the same time. All right, I'm going to stop playing the devil's advocate. I wanted to have some excitement on this discussion. But let me just come to you, Fleur. What is healthy placemaking? I mean, it's a, it's a very nice term. What does, it, uh, what does it mean to you in terms of public spaces and, and for your country? What, what name, sorry? Healthy placemaking. That was the oh, topic of healthy. our discussion. Yeah, I would think uh, it would be a conception of space and of urban planning that uh, uh, incites um, that encourage that encourages specific behaviors like the fact probably to use less cars and and more bicycles or, or to go by foot or use public transportation uh, maybe also to have a better as I said before a better display of activities within a city so that you don't have uh, all the people who live in one place and then who work in another place and activities like restaurants or uh, leisure activities in other places so to mix uh, all activities everywhere, so that it's more uh, it's nicer to to li to live and work and entertain yourself <coughs> in, in, in a place. So, I think healthy would be uh, uh, um, both physical and social health. Yeah, right? I think, but definitely social would be uh, very important. Very. Important. I think unhealthy would be when you have, and, and this is a problem that we uh, have to tackle, in, especially in big cities and the surroundings of big cities, because you have an attraction to the center of the big city and all the cinemas and all the theaters and all the cultural uh, infrastructure will be in the center of the city. And then in the suburbs, you have less, less facilities, uh, less transportation, you have uh, difficulties to access to the center and you don't have any cultural activities or access to knowledge, to culture. So the problem is the uh, spatial divide between uh, you know, where all the uh, interesting activities uh, are and, and a suburb where you get bored because that's yes. nothing to do. So that's really something that that's I think it's not nothing to do with health, but it's very unhealthy because it creates a, a social divide that can bring a lot of crisis, I think. Mm. So. Would you not agree, Vicky? I mean, she's really raised a very important point. Even in cities like New York today, everything is segregated in the center of the city. So real estate across, I mean, when you're talking about public spaces, it's not just park, it's theaters, it's, you know, all, all the happening restaurants or, or the Central Park or the areas that you would like to come and see as tourists. Everything is still in large cities congregated at a central point. Mm. That it's, it's really not gone out to the suburbs. So you have real estate, which is very expensive. You automatically have an economic divide then because you have the richer who can afford in the sit center of the city. So, so is there a way to break it? Are, are town planners thinking that, uh, you know? Uh, I mean, to answer your question, uh, in some way, I, I also kind of fall back to my previous answer about good parent. I feel like if, my, you know, if I have children, I, I would encourage my children to go to a different part outside of our own neighborhood. Like, it's not about parks. Right. No, I mean, like spaces. I'm talking to about explore. like you still have to go to city centers for all your cultural activities. I think that's the point that Fleur raised. Is there? Do you need to look at master planning in a different way, where you don't congregate all the most exciting things happening in public yeah. arena in one zone? Okay, I got it now. So I, I completely agree with you. If I have to take your answer a bit further, I almost have to say we have to get rid of most of the zoning requirements that are getting dated like just so quickly that it doesn't actually reflect the changes in the neighborhood. 
like uh, let's say if we try to get certain parcel we zone to a mixed use area, it takes five years. But that five years, everyone changes in the neighborhood, like it doesn't react to that. So in order to really respond to the need of the society, maybe we just have to give enough like uh, framework to the city and not too much like guideline of where you can build this, how high you can build this, what you can build. It's, it's just giving them a canvas that actually have good plumbing, good electricity, or a good ut uh, utility, but let them be free of like having the market, having what people want dictate what the neighborhood need. So that, in a way, is, is going to diversify and, and try to decentralize uh, what you describe as the downtown cultural zone. Though I must say with my own experience of New Delhi, um, everything was in Delhi, right? There was all the cultural activities, all the monuments uh, of the Mughal period. And then the, this glitzy millennium city with gla tall glass towers came up in Gurgaon. I don't know whether you've heard of it, but it's a pretty famous now city where all grade A office space is happening. There are mixed use development. So everybody had to travel to Delhi for all their cultural activities. You wanted to see any cultural performance, big artists, big theater, and you had to gravitate. It's taken 20 years, but now Gurgaon has its own ecosystem for cultural activities as well. I think that's the kind of time that you need to give to a new city to develop its own ecosystem. Would you agree with that, Vera? It's time which probably would, would decentralize. Decentralize. <laughs> well, I know that we have to get urbanization right. <laughs> if it is not right, we lose it all. And that is the secret. If it is to get it right in decentralization, it depends on every ambience and environment and city. Right. And the culture itself. You know, it's how the concept works. But... Um, the ecosystem is highly needed to go with that concept, getting urbanization right. And the question that I raise, right to whom? Mm. Huh? Yes. It is right to the city and the citizens, both. Because if you create that big theater and you do not create a system for people to go and to reach to, Almost you lost the theater and the attendance. So um, we have an opportunity today that we are creating in this century. We are creating the new cities. We are building new cities like what's going on in Sango. So we have all the alternative that you want. But remember, there are other many cities that already they are there with all the challenges that they have. Many of them are historical. Many of them do have spaces to get that uh, uh, amalgamation mixture between the historical and the modern. But it, I always believe to make it right, how to make the citizen feel right, act and react. And that's what makes urbanization a place where we feel really healthy, where we truly sense the meaning of well-being. All right. I think she's concluded very well for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to open uh, it to the floor for questions. Anybody has any questions or comments to add to it? I mean, this is a group of thinkers and urban planners. So if anybody would like to add to public spaces, how they play a critical role, please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Frederick. I'm currently creating a place in Montreal. Um, it's going to be a place that's going to mix um, the local neighborhood people with uh, the more broader Montreal. Um, and we're doing this through um, the democratization of culture. So I'm wondering, um, in your personal experience, have you tried some, um, some ideas like that where you put people together through one very specific connector in a place that is a public space? Like, what are you doing in Montreal? We'd be very excited to hear that. Well, when you say democratizing, how do you do that? Well, we're creating a landmark for Montreal by reusing the old metro trains. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, put, we're creating a three-story high building with eight different metro trains. And in those buildings, we have a, like an art space that showcases the local culture of Montreal. 
And through that, we bring the, the citizen to see the local culture, but also we, um, we allow the local artists to be showcased to everyone in the world. So did you have in your experience um, different experience like that where you could um, bring people together toward one specific goal in a public space where that you have created? Well, it's happening. I'm so excited to hear that. I had exactly that kind of experience. I launched a project which, which I called uh, uh, Villa Medicis. You know, Villa Medicis is a very famous uh, <coughs> French institution. It's located in uh, Rome, and it's a beautiful palace in Rome, on a hill in, in Rome, where uh, uh, every year a batch of uh, young artists is selected to spend between six months, one year, to uh, carry on a project, an artistic project, which can be writing a, a novel, uh, which can be an installation, which can be music, whatever. It's for artists. And this place is really uh, an amazing place, but very elitic, very uh, elitist. And so uh, when I uh, was appointed Minister of Culture, I heard about a, a place uh, that the, minister had bought, the Ministry of Culture had bought a couple of uh, years ago, but didn't know what to do with. It was a tower in a very remote place near Paris. I say near Paris if you are a bird. But if you are a citizen <laughs> living in that, in that city, it takes you about one hour uh, with, your, with a train to go to Paris, while it's only it's something like 10 kilometers, maybe less than 10 kilometers. So it's uh, very close, but very far away from the cen central Paris. That's the kind of places I was mentioning earlier, where you're close to the center, but you're very far because its accessibility is not there. Mm -hmm. And so this tower was uh, looking a bit ugly, and nobody knew what to do with it. So they let it become derelict. And so for the, I think for the inhabitants who worked in the project uh, uh, buildings around the very poor area, very poor area, for the people who lived there, it, was a sort of, it had become a sort of symbol of the fact that the state had totally forgotten about this district because they let the, the, the building become totally derelict and, and disgusting and, and, uh, and, and ugly. And so I, st I, started, I started a project where I really wanted to create in that specific place, which was very poor, a Villa Medicis, for, uh, con for, for contemporary art, for urban uh, uh, arts, for, for uh, uh, graph, for uh, um, urban, urban arts. Uh, but not to say that urban arts belong to poor areas of the cities, but where people could also maybe have cooking classes. They could define actually uh, what this place would be for. So I really wanted some kind of very cooperative a definition of the purpose of this place, but I wanted it to be quite demanding from an artistic point of view. I wanted real artists, those who were in Rome for a time, you know, who were selected to go to Rome, I wanted them to spend maybe one month, two months, or three months also in that uh, tower, when once it would have been refurbished. And I thought it, would, it was a good idea to bring a very elitist concept in this uh, very remote and, 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 poor, and uh, uh, poor area. So I launched the <laughs> I launched the project, oh. but then unfortunately I I I don't know if I, there has been some follow up. But I thought this was a kind of idea where you can give some pride to the people by bringing something beautiful, an artist, an artistic proposition to them, and make them participate. So uh, it should not be something that they believe is very far from their own culture. So it's something they could, you know, think uh, they could take part uh, uh, in. So I really wanted that to be, um, uh, yeah, the symbol of democratization of culture, a culture that people, even in a, a poor area, mm. can have <laughs> for themselves, because the beauty is not uh, only for people who live in, in a, a favorable or a rich area. So that's the kind of things I think we could, we could, uh, we could do. That's a lovely story. Thank you for that question. We wouldn't have got that or, or uh, the train museum that you're creating in Montreal. So those are the kind of initiatives we need to take, right? I mean, in how do you really get people together for art, culture, for health, for so many things? I want to add a bit to that answer. Uh, like one example I, I would like to look at is probably Bilbao Museum by Frank Gehry. Like many people said it was the beautiful architecture that draw people in, but if uh, during an interview, Frank Gehry actually said that at the time when they finished the museum, the city also built an airport, built all the new park, built all the 
infrastructure to get people to the museum. And the museum itself also have a, a great program to support kids, to support different things. So, uh, so the transportation is one part of it, architecture is one part of it, and the program itself, like just like what she said, uh, that's the purpose. I, I think if you had all three elements together, uh, that place you, you mentioned will be very successful. Um, this is issue never been talked about it during this summit, but um, in Korea, we have light pollution prevention law since 2013, and it has been developed and spread out to, to the nation only, but we didn't even have any information before, so actively it relating to oh no, preventing the Light, so light pollution wasn't that easy. And I'm not quite sure in worldwide how people are controlling light pollution and protect privacy even because the density of the people gathering in the cities and also how we, you could um, prevent, the, not prevent, but helping people sleep really well at night. <laughs> Especially like New York, it's really hard to sleep at night. So, uh, in Times Square, if you live, so right. uh, the the answer to that, uh, I think it uh, is probably twofold. One is design. Uh, like there are many new light fixture, like up lighting in general are just bad, right? So you try we try to aim the light downward or have any uh, light shelf that actually prevent the light from leaking from where they're not supposed to go. Uh, that's one. Uh, so from the design point of view, we can uh, do that. And the second thing is like, uh, I think it's about technology being smart to control the light system. Uh, there, there are many light that can, uh, I mean, even this place can do it already. They can turn off the light when people are not using it. I mean, that's one way to do it. And the second thing is like, uh, uh, many lighting designers are actually talking about it as well. How do we appreciate dark space? like? Uh, I've been to street where uh, there are very, very few uh, street light, like, but there are a lot of restaurants on both sides, so we still get enough illumination on both sides from the restaurant, but not the street light. So program like that or, or, or planning like that can still light up the street uh, uh, without actually putting a permanent light bulb uh, on, the, on the street light. So I, I think uh, so it's three different uh, approaches. All right, I think on that, Note, we're going to conclude uh, Fleur Plelirin, Vicky Chan, and Vera Baboon. Thank you very much for being part of thank this you. panel. And of course, a big round of applause. I think this is the last session. <laughs>